and welcome to episode three of Adafruit and DigiKeys, all the Internet of Things, a six-part program which covers everything you need to know about IoT. In the first two episodes, we looked at transports, the physical and wireless mechanisms used to transfer data between two things, and protocols, the communication standards which enable devices at each end of the transport to speak the same language and understand what is being communicated. Now that we have our things connected and talking, it's time to make them work together to do something useful. And that's what this episode, Services, is all about. Like the human internet, there are services available for almost anything you might want your devices to do. There are free services, paid services, enterprise level and DIY maker friendly. Some services perform only one specific function. Some allow you to design your own custom subservices, and you got everything in between. As you might imagine, there are also innumerable useful services that don't even exist yet, just waiting to be conceived. As you might expect, the choice you make at this stage depends on what you've learned in the previous two videos. If the service you've got your eyes on does not support the MQTT protocol, it can have a big impact on your data and battery usage. Likewise, if you picked a transport like Sigfox, you'll need to make sure that your service can hook up into the Sigfox gateway network. One helpful way to investigate all of these services of things is to list the processes your things need assistance in performing. Most of these processes can be broken down into a handful of categories storing, retrieving, and processing sensor data, coordinating communication with other IoT devices, talking to non-IoT stuff on the internet, receiving configuration changes, and dealing with humans. Knowing what you need will help you choose which service is right for you. Just about every IoT service provides stable, long-term storage for the data your things are producing. Why is that? Well, take this simple IoT weather station. Let's say it's measuring the temperature about once a second and storing that as a single byte of data. If you do the math, it will produce over three kilobytes of data every hour. And then multiplied over a year, that will grow to over 30 megabytes. Sure, 30 megabytes doesn't sound like much from the perspective of your laptop or desktop workstation, but for small, power-efficient embedded hardware, such as one of our ESP32 or SAMD-based Feather devices, those measure storage space in kilobytes. So 30 megabytes is a very big deal. And if this weather station is also producing data for humidity, barometric pressure, and wind speed, it's easy to see that we're going to need to store this data off-device. Even if you have a high-powered, single-board Linux computer, like a Raspberry Pi with eight gigs of storage, you're only a few bits away from a corrupted file system and all that data could be lost. So if you can imagine having tens, hundreds, or thousands of these devices, all producing weather data from different geographic locations, it would be very convenient to have all of this data automatically collected together in one backed up place. But wait! Your devices are connected to the internet, so there's no need to try and store all this data. Instead, your thing will use services to store the data they produce at the very moment they produce it. Now, that service you're using is responsible for storing this raw data, typically in a time-stamped database. They'll also provide a way for you to access that data, either in the form of a user interface or as an API, which other things or apps can use. Okay, for data creating objects, we're set. But there's plenty of devices we've demonstrated that don't just manage sensor data. Instead, they're used for autonomous or remote control, like that IoT lamp we built. Another common process that services provide is a mechanism for multiple devices in an IoT application to communicate and receive events from each other. If you happen to have a setup where all the devices are in the same location, using the same transport, on the same physical network, speaking the same protocol, and within range of each other, it's possible that they can communicate directly without a service. 
An example of how this would be is how the Philips Hue lights and switch controls communicate with a local bridge over Zigbee. But that's an uncommon situation these days, and it can be very constricting. For example, if you wanted to turn off all the lights in your home using an application on your phone or computer, you'd need to install a Zigbee modem. And once you get out of that 30 meter Zigbee range, say because you're at work or out of town, you'd be completely out of luck. In the case of the Hue lights, this is solved with an internet facing IoT service. The Hue bridge chats with all of those lights and switches over Zigbee, but it will also connect to an online message passing service called meethue.com. That service forwards events and messages between the bridge in your living room and the phone app or computer application. The application and light system can independently connect to that messaging service online, and the service will broker communication between them, even though the devices cannot directly connect. Another common scenario is when multiple devices need the ability to publish and subscribe to the same events. Rather than have each device monitor the activity of all the other things, a service makes it possible for each device to use a single, efficient messaging channel, such as MQTT, which produces and consumes only the events that are pertinent to the particular device. This series is called the Internet of Things. So having internet access is obviously going to be one of the most common service desires. As we've shown in the protocols video, there's thousands of APIs available on the internet, from the common news, stock, weather, and beyond. Many of the available IoT services support this sort of functionality by allowing you to create event listeners, specific conditions that run code on that host service to issue a REST call, often referred to as a webhook, to a remote server. You can use this feature to easily integrate your service with almost any REST API on the internet. For example, perhaps you want your weather station to publish an update to your website or post a status message on Twitter. In your services administration console, you would configure a custom listener to watch for a specific event to occur, such as a temperature update event. Now, that exact logic of when the event should fire is customized using a plugin or some scripting language provided by that service. For example, you might want the service to trigger an update on your website with one REST call, and then conditionally publish a message to the Twitter API with another REST call, but only if the temperature is above or below a certain threshold. You can even use this functionality to connect multiple IoT services together. So you might choose one service for its robust data storage and event processing features, and then use a webhook to connect your core service platform to another service that you maybe prefer for analytics. Event listeners, custom functions, and webhooks provide a surprisingly versatile way to build custom business logic on top of your application. And for the most popular APIs on the internet, you'll often have a ready-to-go plugin provided for you. Once your project or product involves multiple things, the ability to manage configuration settings, credentials, and firmware updates at the device level becomes your greatest challenge. Unsurprisingly, many services provide an administration panel as well as a REST API for configuring and maintaining your things. On smaller projects, you might use the administration features to set up everything manually, registering each device in the admin panel and then copying the unique device ID or private key one by one. Compare this to a commercial product where you'd want your users to be able to unbox their device at home and then register it on your website. For this, you need to produce and deliver access credentials to the device in a more automated way, and then publish these access credentials to the service via the REST device configuration interface. Once your devices are registered and connected, some services also provide a channel for remotely pushing configuration data to your devices. Now, usually this is just a built-in way to push a developer-defined blob of data, JSON or binary, and then it's up to the developer, that's you, to sort out the specific details of what the device does with it. It could be something as simple as updating configuration metadata, or as complicated as pushing over-the-air firmware updates. 
Now, this kind of service activity should not be taken lightly. Updating devices with push data is a massive security and operations risk. If your update procedure is hackable, your sensor network could be turned into a distributed botnet. If you make a mistake in deployment, every one of your device products turns into a brick. Ultimately, almost every Internet of Things project will eventually need to provide a way for the things to deal with the humans and vice versa. User interface considerations can range from a mobile app that allows a user to turn lights and off and adjust the volume on a music player, to output features such as status monitors, analytics, and data visualization dashboards. Most providers with a published subscribe service for things will also provide a friendly website and maybe even a REST or MQTT API for you to see and use the data stored. Your end user applications can build on top of those APIs to receive device status, manage deployments, maybe even publish messages directly into the event stream itself. If there's a mobile app, look for providers that offer native notification support for iOS and Android. Native notifications can give your IoT applications a way to tell your user that something is happening even while your app is backgrounded or not running at all. There are also many services that are completely focused on analytics and data visualization. You can find everything from turnkey analytic dashboards to advanced charting SDKs that let you build custom interfaces for your favorite platforms and languages. These can be great for industrial IoT applications where there is a lot of data overload. Most importantly, you, as an engineer, may be really great at RF layout, but not so great at UI design. So if you can leverage the services dashboard, that's one less thing you have to code up before launching your product. There are many, many services available that have been designed for storing, connecting, configuring, and visualizing your IoT projects. Seriously, by the time I'm done shooting this video, there'll likely be a new service announced. From giant corporations like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, to smaller IoT-focused companies like PubNub, Initial State, and even Adafruit, you're likely to find that many of the services you need have already been built, allowing you to focus more on your hardware design rather than designing, building, and maintaining complete service infrastructure. Even if you want to host your own data, there are open source IoT platforms that allow you to self-host your entire service infrastructure, much like privately hosting your own database or web server. Like transports and protocols, choosing the right service providers will depend a lot on your product's requirements. What's best may depend on whether you're looking to create a personal project, quickly iterate on a prototype, manage an industrial deployment, or support the needs of a popular consumer product. Most of the services currently available have been designed with one or more of these needs in mind and can be roughly divided into the following categories. Analytics and data visualization, prototype-friendly infrastructure, hardware-specific end-to-end solutions, and large-scale infrastructure. Even if you end up changing your mind, there's a good chance another service out there will support your transport and protocol, so you don't have to start all over. Let's take a look at some examples of each. Collecting and examining timestamp data is a really common use case. Maybe you're tracking soil moisture on your farm or temperature data from each room in a building. You'll want to keep a historical record, look for trends, and maybe even trigger other actions when appropriate. These services can be used to build a beautiful dashboard for your hobby project, an interface for monitoring the status of an industrial system, or even analytics backend for testing and debugging the consumer product in the field. We'll look at two examples, initial state and Plotly. Initial state provides analytics and custom dashboards for time series data. You can post event data to the service using REST, either directly from your device or as an output from another service such as PubNub or Karyots. More on those later. You could also use this service to import CSV log data that you've captured from a device that you're debugging or prototyping. Plotly, as you may guess, can be used to create interactive charts and plots and custom dashboards. 
most of their products are focused on data science and visualization. But they also have a REST API and an HTTP-based streaming endpoint, which you can use to publish device data. The streaming endpoint allows your devices to send a series of events to the service using a single long-term connection to the server. They provide libraries and example projects for Arduino and Raspberry Pi, which might be just what you need for that project you've been thinking about building. If you are doing anything that requires device communications, event messaging, or mobile integration, there are a number of services that provide cloud services, device libraries, and mobile SDKs to make that happen. We give some of these the prototype-friendly designation, but not because they're only applicable for hobby and smaller projects. These services put particular effort into making it really straightforward to get something working fast. And they're likely to support many of the devices used in hobby or prototype work, such as the Raspberry Pi computer or the ESP32-based hardware. And they might even have demos and how-tos for solving common IoT use cases. Some examples in this category are PubNub and Karyots. At the core of PubNub is an MQTT-based publish and subscribe service. In addition to allowing events to be streamed to and from devices, the PubNub backend also allows you to create custom functions that can be executed whenever specific events occur. This could be used to modify or route events in flight, or even integrate with a REST API from another service, firing off a chunk of data whenever one of your devices publishes an event. Finally, to make it easier to get your IoT project communicating with mobile and web applications, they also provide a wide range of SDKs for iOS, Android, Python, JavaScript, among others. Karyot also provides an MQTT-based publish-subscribe interface for data collection and routing, as well as a REST API for device status updates, administration, and provisioning. Event listeners can be configured to trigger actions when specific event conditions occur, allowing you to integrate with other services. The administration interface also makes it easy to integrate directly with dashboard services like Initial State. There are also cloud services that have been created by some of the manufacturers of popular embedded devices. With these, you get guaranteed working hardware with all of the wireless certifications done and ready to go. The service provides the data storage and event messaging services and APIs that you'd expect from other cloud IoT services. But in addition, you can also expect a high level of integration between their supported hardware, APIs, device libraries, and documentation. In particular, one headache that is taken care of for you is secure and reliable product provisioning and firmware deployment. These two things are very hard to DIY right, so it's best to leave it to the experts. Two examples are Electric Imp, who create a number of Imp module IoT-focused plug-in boards, and Particle IO, makers of the popular Photon, Electron, and Particle Mesh microcontroller boards. These services could provide an easy ramp up if you're already a fan of their hardware. They both provide small scale quantities for hobbyists with the hope that with your success, it'll lead to enterprise level hardware purchases. Particle IO focuses on supporting a prototype to rapid production business need. In addition to supporting their Wi-Fi only photon, cellular only electron, and the next gen mesh, which has BLE and Wi-Fi or cell, they also have first-class support for running the particle firmware on Raspberry Pi. The API provides webhooks and a REST interface and a socket-based publish-subscribe messaging interface. Finally, Particle also provides a desktop and web-based IDE for working with their devices, libraries, cloud APIs, and doing deployments. Electric Imp leans a little bit more towards the business-to-business -business and industrial solutions only. Their support is a bit more specific to their own hardware, and their devices are programmed with a JavaScript-like language called Squirrel. Their cloud APIs are also mostly REST-based, with the addition of an HTTP stream API that lets a device push multiple events over a single long-held connection, and a long-polling HTTP event API that's used to receive push updates. 
Our final category contains all those IoT services that live within a large-scale cloud infrastructure, such as Amazon AWS IoT, Google Cloud IoT, and Microsoft Azure IoT Suite. These services all provide complete MQTT and REST APIs and have the benefit of being tightly integrated with the storage and compute products that are at the core of each company's respective cloud offering. For the advanced developers that regularly work with other cloud products provided by these platforms, their IoT cloud APIs might be a familiar and obvious fit, with benefits that include sophisticated deployment tools and a robust security model. On the other hand, a first introduction to these services can be a bit intimidating, as you soon find yourself generating X509 certificates to authenticate your devices and navigating the nomenclature and white papers that come with the territory. Here are some trade-offs to consider. The ease of getting started versus applicability for larger deployments and customization. Whether you need an off-the-shelf solution or you want to build your own. The quality of documentation and the examples how-to and community support, if it exists. The platform longevity, the vendor reputation, and their overall business model. Whether you want an end-to-end -end platform or you're going to mix and match multiple services. Is anything open source? Who owns the data? Your dependency lock-in and migration options if it doesn't work out. OK, that was services. Now, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of services out there. So we just touched upon a couple of the more popular ones. But once you've picked the service you want to use, and you also, of course, have your transport and your protocol all set up, you're going to want to think about security. And that's what our next episode is about, where the S in IoT stands for security.